All right, let's begin our lecture. So we are on part three of physical layer. And in this part, we will talk about empirical channel models. Now, I don't know how many of you have downloaded that empirical channel model report we talked about last time? None. Okay, it will be really good if you download that because, I mean, actually I should have asked you guys to read that report before for this lecture because all this lecture is in that report. It will be much more easier if you had read that report. But anyway, please do read it. Um, let's see. And we'll see as to how to make you read that before the next lecture. So anyway, so this lecture will talk about empirical channel models, multi-antenna systems, uh, beam forming, and MIMO. So we'll talk about the antennas. Then we'll talk about the coding, space-time block codes in particular, duplexing, time division duplexing, and then OFDM, OFDMA, SFA, FDM, and so on and so forth. So much of the last four parts are about recent advances in wireless networking. Okay? So whatever happened, and then that makes a difference in the latest technologies that are being de uh, designed and developed for wireless. But before we get there to those de developments, um, we want to continue about the models as to how do you model a channel. And a number of people have done some studies and there are a number of models. So if you talk to, or if you read a wireless paper, they will say we are using HATA model, we are using COS-231 model, and so on and so forth. So for that reason, you need to know these terms. All right? And, um, and so we will, we will introduce you those, those terms. So first of all, HATA model, HATA is a Japanese. Basically, so what he did was, in Tokyo, he measured the signal reflection at different frequencies. A signal received at different frequencies. So F, FC is the carrier frequency here. D is the distance. HT is the height of the transmitting antenna. HR is the height of the receiving antenna. So he did lots of measurements and then fit a curve like that. All right, so this is basically a measured results in Tokyo. Obviously, it will not apply to any other city, but it's, you know, better than nothing. So his result says that if you are at a distance D, the path loss would be so much. Obviously, path loss depends upon the transmitting antenna height and receiving antenna height and the carrier frequency and the distance. However, he had done measurement only in 150 to 1500 megahertz range. If you change from that range, obviously the distance will be different. If you change the city, the number would be different and so on and so forth. But this is the beginning. I mean, actually this is the mother of all other models in the sense that once he did that in 1968, every other model referred to that and then, you know, said, well, why that is not right or, you know, how we are changing it and so on and so forth. So Hata model is something that everybody has to know. I mean, you don't have to memorize any of this. But you have to know what, when you say Hata model, you have to remember that, well, there is somebody who did measurement and there is some kind of formula which I can look it up. Is that good enough? I can yeah. Understand what the correction factor is. Yeah. Based upon the size of the coverage area, correction factor for the mobile antenna height based upon the size of the cover coverage area. So there is a number A which might be in a table which says that if you are covering two miles, use A equal to so much. If you use just a small area, one mile, then you use this so coverage area, the part of the, the area of the city that you are covering. And the number A is in some other table which is not here. All other numbers are specified. So 69, 26, 13, all these numbers are specified, but this number here, A, Actually, um, and this one will depend upon and will, de will be looked up in some other table, in more detailed table. All right? Actually, A is not a constant. A is a function of the receiving antenna height. So you go to that table, and then you can figure out what that term is. So even this is not, basically, without that term, the model was giving a lot more errors. And so he put that term and he gave a table. So 
So then, other companies picked up, actually other companies means the ITU picked it up. ITU is International Telecommunication Union. That is the union of all telephone companies. And um, it's like part of ISO, so uh, or, or not ISO, UNO, so that um, whatever rules they make in ITU, generally all the carriers all over the world follow it. Right? And they wanted to have a model, they have standards, ITU has standards, and they wanted to have a model for this one. However, they needed it for another frequency, 2 gigahertz. Now, HATA doesn't cover that frequency, 2 gigahertz. It covers to what value? 1.5 gigahertz. And therefore, they had to extend that. And this is the extension. It's very similar to HATA model, but the numbers are different because now we are talking of a different carrier frequency range and then they have added a term CM which is for the medium sized cities 0 and 3 dB for metropolitan areas. So they added that factor. So cost 231 is the next most popular model. Okay. Now this applies from 1.5 to 2 gigahertz. Antenna height from 30 to 300 meters, the mobile antenna height 1 to 10 meters, and the distance of 1 to 20 kilometers. All these parameters are something that you can look up when you need to. But if you were doing some studies and somebody said, well, we are in cost 231, you know what they are talking about, and then you can go and look up the rest. Right? And if you are really writing papers like we do, then you have to go and verify that you are satisfying all the assumptions that they have put there, these conditions. Right? So there is another extension to cost two third before I go to the next one. Is this is this clear enough? Right? And then so actually there is one more extension which I am not talking about, but there are other extensions of Hata model done by the same cost two thirty one. So I, I, I forgot to explain what is cost two thirty one. Cost is cooperative for scientific and technical scientific and technical C O S T. And so this is the European organization, which is like ANSI or, you know, there are many organizations in the United States that make, that make um, standards. So this is an European organization, and so this is named after them, COST, C-O-S-T, not a person. This is a whole group. All right. Then the ITU came around, and they made some path loss models. And um, actually, they have many path loss models. One is for indoor office. One is for outdoor to indoor pedestrian. One is for vehicular, and so on and so forth. So when we design these networks, let's say we were involved ourselves involved in WiMAX design, then we had to use one of these models depending upon where the user is. If it is indoor, outdoor to indoor, or you know vehicular. And, um, and then they have models for low delay spread and medium delay spread. So the low delay spread happens when you are going at a low speed or you are in an area where there is um, the difference in the arrival of different reflections is smaller. Anyway, so there are several models and one of the models is this one. This is the pedestrian model. So there are six different models, by the way. As you can see, there are three times two. There are three scenarios and two delay spreads. So they have six models. I'm just going to put here one. And um, even in that one, they have two models, channel A and channel B. Um, and what they're doing is they're specifying the tap. So if you remember from the last time, actually this is why it was required to read the last time's lecture, and I, I forgot to put that as an assignment. But if you would have read the last time's lecture, anybody remembers tap delay model we talked about last time? Yeah. So tap delay model was that you say, if I send one pulse, I will get five pulses at what time delay they are and what value they are. Right? So that's what they use, tap delay model. So these are the taps, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. These are the delays, 0, 110, 190, and 410 nanoseconds. And this is the power. You get a 0 minus 9.7, minus 19.2, and minus 22.8. This is how much you lose 
if you are at 400, sorry, if you send one pulse, you will get one pulse at zero, you will get another pulse at 110, another pulse at 119, and third, fourth pulse at, min, uh, at 410, and these are the values of those pulses, amplitudes of those pulses. Similarly, channel B has actually six taps and six values, and then they also specify what the Doppler spectrum looks like. So the Doppler spectrum is a graph, and I am not going to plot that graph here, but this is saying classic spectrum, and there are other method methods of specifying the Doppler spectrum. So again, um, when you're working on these, you're probably working with some physical layer people, but you need to know when somebody says, I'm using ITU pedestrian model, what that means. Okay, all right. So now, first of all, anybody has a problem with the tab delay model or remembers, does not remember the tab delay model? And that's why I introduced the tab delay in the last class so that we can use it here. And do I need to go back to that or you feel comfortable to go back? So this is basically a tab delay model. We have the number of tabs which changes from one through, you know, basically four in this case and six in that case. This is the horizontal, the, the delay value, and the, the delay, at what delay the tap is, and this is the vertical value as to how much is. By the way, does anybody understand what does minus power mean? Okay, what does minus power mean? Does that mean the reduction of power that happens as you go through the taps? Yeah, that is, the, so, so, there are two things. So, so first of all, this is only a reduction in power anyway. This is specifying the power loss. This is a power loss model. However, if suppose somebody said that I am transmitting minus 10 dBm, if they are just transmitting minus 10 dBm, can they do that? They cannot transmit minus 10 dBm? Does that mean their output power is greater than their input? No. No, no, no. Okay. So how, so last time Pran, you had to ask the question as to what does the, how do you specify power as a dB because dB is a ratio and I said that it is with respect to 1 milliwatt. Anytime you have transmitting more than 1 milliwatt, the dB will be positive and anytime you are transmitting less than 1 milliwatt, the dB will be negative. So let me just ask you a question and if you can do it in your brain. Suppose you are transmitting 1 microwatt. Do it on paper, maybe. You are doing one microwatt. How much power is that? How many dBm is that? One microwatt. Remember, you have to do the ratio with one milliwatt first. Then you take a power base 10, log base 10, and then you multiply with 10. So let's do those three steps. One microwatt versus one milliwatt. What's the ratio? Say it loudly. Doesn't matter even if it is wrong. Say it loudly. 10,000. No, no. It is 1,000. 10 raised to 3. First of all, the ratio is 10 raised to 3. 1 microwatt versus 1 milliwatt. How much is the ratio? If you put on the top 1 microwatt, on the bottom you put 1 milliwatt, you get 10 raised to minus 3, right? Take a log base 10. How much will you get? Minus 3. Multiply it by 10 minus 30 dBm. So if somebody is transmitting minus 30 dBm, they are transmitting one microwatt. All right? So yes, the power can be negative in dBm. It's not in microwatt. You cannot transmit minus one microwatt, but you can transmit minus 30 dBm. Right? Because dB is a ratio and it is a ratio with respect to one microwatt, so you can be transmitting less than one microwatt, or you could be transmitting more than one microwatt. Right? When you are transmitting more than one microwatt, the power is positive. When you are transmitting less than one microwatt, the power is negative in dBm. Is that clear now? All right. So let's move on to another ITU model, just as an example. So this is a vehicular model. In the vehicular model, again, they have a channel A and channel B. And um, and then um, 
they have the delay spreads, tap values, uh, the delay values and then the amplitude values similarly for channel A and channel B. So now when you use something we will say well we are using ITU vehicular model for medium is, uh, delay spread and channel B, channel B. So they will also say which channel we are using where there are two different alternate models and people are not sure which one to use so they just I mean some people will, will use one or the other. So you also specify which one of these you are using. All right, that finishes our channel model issue, channel model discussion. All right, and please read that handout. Okay, the handout, where is the handout? Anybody remembers where is the handout? We haven't given it to you, but it is online. Anybody remembers where it is online? Huh? Yeah, in the end of the last lecture, there is a reading list in that one we have written down actually this is um, so you just go to my website and then download it and then print it out it's 25 pages and read it all right um, now we are going to go to talk about antennas and in the next four slides we will talk about these four things receiver diversity transmitter diversity beam farming and mimo so let's get on to those Receiver diversity, what you could do is you could put multiple receiving antennas. So instead of receiving in one antenna, you could put three or four as shown here. Now each antenna is at a different location and therefore gets a different signal, a slightly different signal because the phase or something might be different. If they are very close to each other, they will all get the same signal and then I mean all you will get is maybe a bigger antenna effect. But if you put them farther apart, then they will get different phases and then you can cancel out some things and add some things, things like that. So depending upon where you put them, you can reduce the, you can reduce the signal to, you can in, improve the signal to noise ratio. Signal to noise ratio, when you improve means better signal, less noise. One simple thing you could do is you could just have, let's say four antennas and then measure the quality of the signal in each of those four, this one gives you one mic, well let's say, let's use in dB. Let's say this gives you zero dB, this gives you minus 10 dB, this gives you plus 10 dB and so on and so forth. Which antenna will we use? The one that has the maximum power. Right? So that is called selection combining. Selection combining means you just select one which has the highest power. Then there is a threshold combining. Threshold combining, select the first antenna with the SNR above a threshold. So you go through the list and the first antenna which is above certain threshold and yet we are talking about SNR. So basically whichever looks good enough signal you just take that one. Maximum ratio combining, the phase is adjusted so that all signals have the same phase and then weighted sum is used to maximize the SNRs. In this case maximum ratio means you add them up but before you add them up you you manipulate them so that the phases become the same okay yeah so the weights could be different too so first of all you you adjust the weight and then you first before you adjust the, you that do the weights you do the you do the phase adjustment and the reason phase adjustment happens is suppose you put the antennas which are lambda by 2 apart. So lambda is the wavelength. If you put them lambda by 2 apart, the phases would be very different on those two antennas. Because you see it takes one cycle, one lambda to have the same phase. If, 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 if sine wave is coming to you, if you put two antennas which are half wavelength apart, then you will get half. 180 degree phase difference, right? And if you put them one quarter <coughs> wavelength apart, you will get, it's like, you, you can easily imagine in the water, when you throw a stone in the water and you put your finger in one place, and you put your finger in another place, if the two are away by one quarter of a wavelength, the phases of the signal would be 90 degrees apart. Right? When one is on the maximum, other might be in the minimum and so on and so forth. So, 
So that's what we do here is in the last one, we adjust the phase and then we weight them. Okay, so there are many ways. Now these are all, by the way, this whole thing is there's a lot of mathematics behind it which I'm not going through because we really want to just understand the terms and the books on wireless communication spent whole chapter on receiver diversity, just one chapter on receiver diversity. And there's a lot of math behind it which I have skipped. You could do the same thing on the transmitter side. You could be sending multiple signals to transmit the signal and um, this is sometimes preferred than the receiver diversity because receiver is a very small device. You cannot put two antennas on this which are you know, very far apart, right? But the transmitter is on the top of a tower. You can put multiple antennas there and generally they are put. So whenever they have a tower or something, they just don't put one antenna and they put multiple antenna. So they are doing this transmitter diversity. It's much easier to do at the transmitter. And if the channel is known, if we know the channel, which we can figure it out by asking the receiver, and this is done, is that the transmitter is continuously asking the receiver, how is the signal, how is the signal? And they can figure it out how it is good or bad, they can adjust the phases. And um, that can be done by sending some well-known sequence. I can send you 110101 and you know that you got some error. You can say, no, no, I got too much error here. Then they adjust something else. So this kind of monitoring is going on in parallel with the real transmission. Okay. What characterizes the channel in this case? What is what? Yeah, yeah, so we, last time we talked about channel model. The last lecture started with the channel model where we said HF. If you remember the matrix capital HF, that is the channel model. So basically, by after all this is done, the transmitter has the idea of that HF. That's the metric that can be used. So it, you take the transmitter signal multiplied by HF, you get the received signal. Right? The transmitted signal was a, was a vector, the channel model was a matrix, and then you get a vector which is received vector. Right? So that is what we mean, that the, if the channel is known, then we phase each component and weigh it before transmission so that they arrive in phase of the receiver and they maximize the signal to noise ratio. If the channel is not known, then we use something called space-time block codes, which we are going to discuss next. Actually, not next, just after two slides. So anyway, so there are two things we learned so far. One is that you could use multiple receiving antennas. And if you have multiple receiving antennas, they will receive signals at different phases for sure and generally at different amplitude and so on and so forth. Then you can combine them if you're smart enough as to how to combine the phases. You can combine them to your advantage. Second thing you could do is you could transmit multiple on multiple antennas and um, that way, you could send the phases so that when somebody has only one antenna, they somehow combine. All right. So all of this, basically, uh, in addition, what you could do is you could use antenna designs such that the transmission is in one particular direction. So if you remember, we plotted these graphs about the directional antennas. So what this is saying is at this time, the transmission is such that most of the power is going in this direction, very little power in the other directions. So it's not omnidirectional. This is a very directional antenna. But what is different here is that we can change the direction in a millisecond. So there are antenna designs such that by manipulating some electrical things in the background, first it is pointing to this house, a millisecond later it is pointing to the second house, a millisecond later it is transmitting to, or microsecond later it is transmitting to the third house. So we are, it's like we take a flashlight and we point it here, point it there, point it there, point it there. So whoever we want to talk to, we make it directional in their direction. 
that is called beam forming. Okay, that way we don't waste any energy in any direction where we don't need it at that particular moment. Okay, so I phase shifting various received signals and basically uh, I said here phased antenna arrays. So what that is, is that they have an antenna design in which they use a whole array of antenna. So you might have 4 by 4, you might have 16 antennas. 16 little plates and um, so they will change the signal phase and everything else so that everything is directed to one direction and then they will change it slightly so that it goes to that direction. So when you can dynamically change the direction that is called beam farming. And similarly you can do on the receiving side as well you can focus on a receiving in a particular direction. So this house, for example, could have a beam farming receiving antenna. So it could be just focusing, but here it is much easier because the, this is not moving and not really, there are not that many base stations. So it could just be, so generally we will be doing more here on the transmitting side where we want to talk to 100 people. So we want to change the direction every microsecond. And all this is possible because now we have digital signal processing, DSP chips that can very quickly analyze and, and calculate and then they can basically do the signal processing and therefore we can, we also call it self-aligning. Previously when they used to have antennas, they used to, I mean actually even now, even you get a, let's say a dish, the dish guy has to come to your home and manually move the dish to align it to this satellite, right? Well, there are antenna designs where you don't have to do that by tricks like this. This is so expensive that basically that's why the dish doesn't use it yet. But in some situations they can just you know, afford that cost and particularly since there is the transmitter of only one place, we can do that so that it is aligned. And, and this is much more useful for non-broadcast signal because if you want to do broadcast like the dish does, where they want to send in every direction, everything, then it doesn't use, it doesn't help. But when you want to do point to point, to multiple stations, then this is very good. All right, so everybody understands, first we understood the transmitter diversity, then we understood the receiver diversity, now beam farming. And what is the new about beam farming? That we can, what can we do? What is the difference about beam farming? What is the key? Did you very quickly change yeah. the direction? Good, that's the point, that we can very quickly change the direction and at a microsecond uh, range, time frame. That brings us to uh, one more thing that we need to talk about or know in wireless is MIMO. You all of you I'm sure have heard MIMO because if you go and buy today any Wi-Fi equipment, it says it does MIMO this year, not last year, this year. Why does it do MIMO? Because the new standard has come out which uses MIMO, new Wi-Fi standard. What is MIMO? MIMO means you have multiple transmitters and multiple receivers, multiple inputs and multiple outputs. So when you have multiple transmitters, that is multiple outputs. When you have multiple receivers, that is multiple input. And so when you have both transmitters and receivers many, and that is called MIMO. And this is an example of a MIMO device, three antennas right there. Right, if you have a base station which has three antenna, your computer might have two antennas too. And so actually you don't see the antennas in your computer, but in this computer, for example, in my computer, there might be two antennas on two sides of the screen. Okay. And so they so they design these things so that there are multiple receivers and multiple transmitters. And the advantage is that now, by having multiple receivers and multiple transmitters, we have these all these DSP chips which allow us to really distinguish between all these n times m signals. So let's say we have two by three here, two transmitters and three receivers, six signals are coming. Something is starting from here, getting reflected and coming to that antenna, coming to that antenna, coming to that antenna, similarly and so on and so forth. So there are six things coming in Previously, those six will interfere with each other and kill each other. Now, we know how to help them out each other. And so now you get not really six times, 
but you can easily get two times the bit rate. So for example, previously with one antenna you could get one kilobit, with this system you could get minimum of the two. So if you have two transmitters and three receivers, you could get up to two times one kilobit, two kilobits, to the same number of hertz. The key is that number of hertz is not changing, we don't have more spectrum. For the same spectrum with MIMO, we can do twice as much. So for example, and we will talk about this later on in 11N, but 11N is the one which is which is using MIMO. So previous to this 11N, we had 11A, B, and G. Many of you have 11B, 11G, 11A devices, right? However, if you buy today, you will find 11N. 11N standards came out last year. So if you buy 11N, then you will get this. Now, 11G gave you, I don't know, anybody remembers how much 11G gives? Yeah, 802.11G. 54 megahertz, megabits, 54 megabits for 20 megahertz. Your channel is 20 megahertz and you get 54 megabits. With 11N, you get twice as much. For the same spectrum, you get 100 megabits. Okay, how you get that? By this, MIMO. Okay, so I, done, I wouldn't use the word protocol here because protocol is generally at the higher layer, right? Here, basically, this is the way of analyzing the signal and transmitting the signal. This is physical layer we are talking about. So, so improvement, in the in improvement in the analysis capabilities of our being able to distinguish between these three signals. For example, this antenna is receiving three signals. Actually, it is in many, many signals. As shown here, it is receiving three signals, one coming directly, one coming from reflection, blah, blah, blah. And it can somehow distinguish them by going through the waveform in the digital signal processing channel, in the, in the DSP chip. It can look at the waveform in very close shape and then figure out that, yeah, this is that signal, and this is that signal, and therefore, how do you combine that? So our analysis capability has gone up and therefore, we can get much more. And so the thing is, suppose we have three by four, that is, we, we have three transmitting and four receiving antennas. You should be able to get up to a factor of 12, okay? But generally, you may not get 12. You are guaranteed, I mean, if you get less than three, then you are really, I mean, you know, not really getting, doing it right. So you get minimum of the two for sure, generally. Again, not for sure. Nothing is for sure because you could really misalign everything and kill each other. But um, if you do it right, then you should be able to get the minimum or maximum as much as the product. So with this 2 by 3, minimum you would get how much? And the maximum? 6, right. So here is an example. In a Vimax, situation when somebody measured in Vimax, it was 16 is Vimax, and they measured and they found that with um, 1 by 1, they could get 1.2 bits per hertz. For each cycle, they could get 1.2 bits. With 1 by 2, they could get 1.8. With 2 by 2, they could get 2.8, and 2 by 4, 4.8, and so on and so forth. So you see, with 4 by 4, maximum they could get 16, but they didn't get 16. 16 times 1.2, right? They got only 5.1, so almost like a factor of 4. And these are all approximate numbers because if you were to measure somewhere else, the number would be different. I mean, so there are so many variables because number of reflectors and things like that, you know, the environment makes so much difference. All right, so now you understand really, I mean, when somebody says MIMO, what it is, but there is a whole theory behind it that MIMO is a topic for which there are books, just books, just on this topic, MIMO. And again, we are not going to go to that level of detail here, but just understand the key feature that MIMO means multiple transmitters, multiple receivers, and that you can get minimum and maximum gain. I mean, in the, at least in the terms of the bit rates. All right. 
then people have also made some new in discovery in the last number. We are all talking about all of this in the last 5-10 years. And that's why I'm having difficulty finding a book because not one book covers all of these. Okay? And if they cover it, they cover it in such a great detail that you can't follow it. So if you find a book on MIMO, it is full of equations and mathematics and theory behind it that we cannot want to do, we don't want to do. So, STBC is another example. STBC is a code invented in 1998 by Valid Wahid Tarok, who is at Harvard. And um, so what he said is that if we have two antennas, then if we divide the time into slots, so that in the first slot, on the first antenna, I send something, S1, symbol S1. Now these communication scientists talk about every symbol as a complex number. I, so complex number is something plus I times something else, imaginary part and the real part. Have you heard of the complex numbers before, right? So there, this is a complex. So the, 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 because what happens is every signal has a phase and an amplitude. So when you have a phase and amplitude, you can talk about, you know, that you can talk in terms of complex numbers imaginary part and the uh, and the real part. So they say in the first slot I should send, send the symbol S1 on the antenna 1 and I should send another symbol S2, the next symbol S2 on antenna 2 while in the second slot, that means suppose if our slot is 1 millis, actually let's say our slot is 1 microsecond, so in the first microsecond we will transmit S1 and S2, in the second microsecond we will transmit minus S2 star and S1 star where a star means conjugate. Conjugate is if you have A plus IB, that's a complex number, the conjugate of A plus IB is A minus IB. So the imaginary part is negat negated. So you transmit that one, that basically means that you change the phase such that it is negative, now opposite of that. And so you transmit minus S2 star here and, and if you do that, then the columns are orthogonal means they basically help out each other and it, as opposed to cancelling them and so this will receive a signal which is much better okay so you can do much more better rate so um, so what we have done is we have divided into space and time this axis is time what we do in the first microsecond what we do in second microsecond you could do it in more you know you don't have to have two by two here I have shown you example of two by two you have two antennas which is space and you have two time slots, which is time. So this is called space-time block codes, STBC. So now you see, so we have learned a lot in the last five, ten years in wireless, such that now we can get more bits out of the same hertz. This is another technique for getting more bits out of the same hertz. Okay, by properly sequencing the symbols so that for the same number of antennas basically we if we do it right then we can get more right so with this one theoretically you could get twice the rate so you if we are getting previously one bit per second you could get two bits per second with this technique theoretically and if you do more antennas you know, you should be able to get more. Again, you know, there's a lot of theory behind, I mean, to, ex to really get as to how much more you will get by how many antennas and how many slots. All right. So we are actually coming towards the end of um, our physical layer and, and this is actually a simple concept. And that has to be the duplexing. What is duplexing? Duplexing means two directions. Right? So generally you want to talk in two directions. I want to talk to you and you want to talk to me. You know, the, the mobile wants to talk to the base and the base wants to talk to the mobile, right? So how do we do that? There are two ways to do it. One is that we give you one frequency to speak and I use another frequency to speak and then we continuously speak in, on those two frequencies. Right? So I can continuously speak and you are receiving on that frequency that I am transmitting and then you are sending on a totally different frequency 
and I am receiving another frequency. So this is called full duplex. Right, full duplex means continuous two directional traffic, bi directional traffic. Then another method would be that I speak for some time and then I stop, then you speak for some time, then you stop, then I speak for some time. So we alternate. Right? That is called half duplex. Half duplex. Why it is duplex? Because we have two directional traffic. We have two directions, but it is only half the time. You get only half the time, right? So that is half duplex versus full duplex. If you have no way of going in the other direction, that is called simplex. Simplex is only one way. Right? All right. So here is the way to understand this thing. Um, suppose you have you are going going on the highway or on the road. Clayton Road was a good example for some time when the construction was going on on the highway. Normally, a big road like Clayton Road or any other big road is what? Simplex, duplex, half duplex, full duplex. Is normally it is full duplex, but when they have a construction going on one side, what do they do? Yeah, they put a guy with a stop sign and then saying stop right here and then they switch those two guys the directions to the first this traffic goes and then that traffic goes. That is half duplex. Most of the roads in the city and downtown, many of the roads are what? Simplex. So we have those examples of simplex, half duplex and full duplex. Similarly on the airs, air waves we do the same thing. So when we do full duplex we need two frequencies and that is called FDD frequency division duplexing because we are getting the two directions by dividing the frequency right if we do half duplex then this is called time division duplexing because we are getting the two directions by dividing the time Right? Now each of them have their own advantages. Now with time division duplexing, when you speak, you get twice the frequency. I mean like if suppose we had 1 megahertz available, or let's say 20 megahertz available, then if you do FDD, I can only use 10 megahertz and you can use 10 megahertz. Right? And you have to use continuously. If you are not going to speak continuously, then you are going to waste that 10 megahertz. At the other side, we get 20 megahertz in the TDD, 20 megahertz, and we can decide as to how much you want to use and how much I want to use. I could say, well, since you're not speaking, maybe I can use 95% of it, and you can use 5% of it, right? Or we could change that number anytime we want, right? So TDD uh, is actually generally good for data and FDD is generally good for voice. Why it is good for voice? Because when we do a voice communication like a telephone, generally unless you are giving a lecture like this one, you are talking equally. Right? You talk one millisecond, I mean, whatever number of seconds and minutes, they talk the same number of minutes or seconds. And so the traffic is 50-50. And therefore the voice networks generally use FDD. And most of the cell phones today, even today, are using FDD. All right? So we give different frequencies in parallel. However, WiMAX, which was designed for data, obviously promoted TDD. And the TDD allows more flexible sharing of downlink and uplink data rates. So then, you know, you can decide how much goes downlink and how much goes uplink does not require paired spectrum, so, so you don't need two spectrum, you just need one spectrum. Easy channel estimation, because now everybody is a transmitter and a receiver, so both sides can really calculate what the channel is, right, because you need the receiver to figure out what the channel is, right, the transmitter transmits the known symbol and the receiver figures out what happened to that. Similarly, this one transmits the known symbol and the receiver figures out what happened to that. So it's much easier to estimate the channel. But there is one big negative with TDD. And that is that if you have multiple base stations in the neighborhood, 
they all have to speak at the same time. Because if one base station speaks while the other is receiving, the little tiny mobile station which is sending only few milliwatts or microwatts will not be heard because of this big signal coming from the base station. Big stations use, base stations use a lot of power, right? But the tiny mobile speaks has very little power. And therefore, a tiny mobile will not be heard if somebody is talking, somebody like base station is talking. So all the base stations have to agree. So even though we said that you can change the ratio any time for the PDD, you really don't change the ratio any time. You just set up in the day one of the end of the setting up that, okay, we'll do two times down and one times up, two to one. A lot more traffic goes down than goes up. So we, can, we could say we will do two times down and one time up and that's it and then everybody will do that 2 to 1 forever because if somebody wants to do 1.9 to 1 they have to inform everybody else and everybody else has to change it and that's too much work so the ratio can be set but it is set on day one all right so everybody understand the positive and the negative of tddd yeah Okay, what is the period? So when you, if you go and ask that, that I want to set up a cell, some uh, cell um, service in St. Louis, and you go to FCC and you say I want a spectrum, they will have to give you two frequency bands. I mean two frequency, let's just call them frequencies. Two spectrum they will have to give you. They will say, okay, all right, your uplink will be in, in 5.4 to 5.41, and your downlink would be from 5.7 to 5.71. So they will give you two frequency and they are paired in the sense that it's already decided beforehand that all of this is for down and all of this is for up and um, in generally 45 megahertz apart so when somebody gets this they get that okay so basically the, there are two things first of all somebody did this study that okay all right, we have to be separated by at least 45 megahertz all right because if you are Closer, then you know you can start confusing each other. Okay, so now as long as we have 45 megahertz, we have this much spectrum available for you know, and this much we have two bands available. Now we could give them any way we want, okay. but just to keep life simple, we just divide them in equal number. Ten numbers here, ten numbers here. For one, you get this one. For two, you get this two. Right, so there's a paired spectrum. Yeah, it doesn't require pairs. You just get this band and that's it. I mean, you use that band for both up and down. Okay. Anything that is TDD. Now it is, by the way, a lot of more. So Bimax was the, let me not say first one, but basically everything that happens after Bimax is now more TDD because of this flexibility of being able to download more than upload. Remember, everything is asymmetric. Your DSL is asymmetric. You can download 6 megabits, but upload is 512 kilobits. Why? Because you don't upload much. And there is a possibility, and, and the carrier saves money by designing circuits like that. If they had to design a circuit where you could upload 1 megabit, everybody could upload 1 megabit, and all, that is much more expensive. And we can talk about that whenever the time comes. But the traffic is generally asymmetric and therefore TDD is better. If with FDD, you could do the same thing. I mean, actually, what you could do is you could give 10 megabits down and 1 megabit up, and then you get the ratio of 10 to 1. But traditionally, the T FDD has been equal, symmetric. All right, so now you understand TDD. The next is inter-symbol interference and I have a cartoon to explain this um, well it's just to entertain basically in some sense but the, here's the thing the wireless channel is like a tunnel in which you send people who are really tall and really thin. And as they travel, they become short and fat. Right? 
and both are bad shortness is bad and the fatness is bad why because if you become very small we may not be able to see you right shortness is bad on the other hand fatness is bad because if we have too many of I mean, if we have become too fat we can't even put two people on the road <laughs> right so that's what happens to the signals on the wireless as well so if you send one little thin pulse see this is what we send an impulse all right it's tall and thin when it comes out we get a whole kind of a spectrum right so this is basically fat and short so what we get is this from this we get that right now if you put too many of these suppose we send two pulses blue and the red this is the blue one and this is the red one so because of the fatness they can run into each other right and um, and lots of things can happen when two people run into each other but one thing that can happen is that they, they basically you won't be able to send that many bits you won't be able to distinguish the bits from each other right and so so basically this is called inter symbol interference when two symbols which were sent they become you know they kind of start interfering with each other that is called inter symbol interference this limits how many symbols you can send and this basically depends upon how fat they can become this is why we say that the number of bits depends upon the delay spread this is actually the delay spread right when you see this and suppose this is 4 microsecond wide that means the delay spread is 4 microsecond and therefore you cannot send more than one bit per 4 microsecond or something like that without avoiding inter symbol interference and if you send more than that then you will get inter symbol interference so this is what inter symbol interference is basically when the signal starts the, the bits start inter uh, actually we don't use the word bits why because we use the symbols here in wireless world because we just take multiple bits like we say 0 0 and one, and we transmit as one combination some particular phase and amplitude so 0 0 is our symbol and that symbol can take four values 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 so we transmit multiple bits at a time those multiple bits are called a symbol right so when two symbols start interfering then we call it inter symbol interference and so one way to avoid this is what we call OFDM orthogonal frequency division multiplexing and um, so if somebody gave you one megahertz spectrum you have two choices you could use one megahertz spectrum completely for one transmission or you could divide into 10 channels of 100 kilohertz each you could do 10 of them each of them is 100 kilohertz so total is 1 megahertz or you could do one of them with right in this case the bits would be very very small and very very close to each other right and they will run into each other very fast they won't go very far here the bits are big with 100 kilohertz your bits are at least 10 times bigger for the same coding right and therefore they can go farther before running into each other and so people figured this out that it is better to use multiple carriers this is called multi carrier because now we are using 10 carriers as opposed to one carrier it is much better to use divide that into pieces and then use small pieces than to use one big piece therefore we started dividing that into 256 or more and actually in Vimax we transmit divide into 1000 so we take the whole band and divide into 1000 little pieces in each piece we send a separate signal and when we send the signal we keep the carriers such that when the when the peak of any carrier happens if you look at the peak of any carrier the other carriers are at zero so if you look at carefully you know then you will notice that these carriers have been positioned so that um, peak of one 
is at the zeros of the other, so they don't interfere, and so that is called orthogonal. So normally we do frequency division multiplexing. Frequency division multiplexing simply means that we divide the frequency into multiple pieces, right? But we do orthogonally. Orthogonally means that none of them will interfere with each, each other. So if they don't interfere, then you get very high number of bits per second, uh, per, uh, per hertz. And then each carrier is modulated with whatever you want to modulate it with, with BPSK, QPSK, QAM, whatever it is. And so this is the technique which is used in ANG, 802.11 ANG. So remember, 802.11B gave you how much? Anybody remembers how much 11B gave? 11 megabits. A and G give you 55 or 56 megabits. How did they do that factor of 5? By OFDM. Okay. Hertz has not changed. All of the 11s still use 20 megahertz. But different varieties as the time came by, now all of this is happening very fast. Remember, this A and G came out in the last 10 years. So we are learning and we are putting into into practice right away. Right? A and G uses that. In fact, um, uh, even DSL uses it. DSL is not wireless, but even in the wired world, we do the same thing. And um, digital video broadcast uses that, and um, and this is possible because we all this is done using fast Fourier transform FFT. And previously we could not do fast Fourier transform because they require big computers to do them. But nowadays our little processors can do fast Fourier transform, so we can in every little device we put a processor to do FFT, inverse FFT as well. So IFFT is inverse FFT, FFT, inverse fast Fourier transform and fast Fourier transform. All right. So what is the, to know about OFDM? OFDM is first of all FDM, frequency division multiplexing. What that means is we divide the spectrum into multiple pieces. Then O stands for orthogonal. We divide it in such a way such that the peak of each carrier there is no interference from the other carriers. Well, the peak of each one corresponds to the zeros of the others. I mean, basically, this one will go down to zero power when this one is at the peak. Okay. By the way, this is not the sine wave. What it is is the spectrum. So, for this carrier, this is how the power spectrum looks like. Power spectrum doesn't have to be following sine wave. It looks like sine wave, but this is not time domain. This is frequency domain. So on the x-axis, I have put frequency, and the y-axis, I have put the power. So for this particular carrier, the power is following this graph. And whenever that power is maximum, the other carriers have power zero. All right. So the advantage of OFDM is that you can very easily implement with FFT and the IFFT. And um, the complexity is, well, I mean, this is again something that the wireless guys will, communication guys will talk more than the computer guys. But they will say that the complexity is order of B log BT, where B is the bandwidth and T is the delay spread. If you want to go that far, what is the delay spread you want? the complexity is B log BT as opposed to B square T with equalization. So the next, uh, the other technique was equalization technique where you send any number of carriers and at the end you have to equalize them because some carriers will have more loss, some carriers have less loss and then you have to do equalization. And so that technique required B square T. So if you use 100 carriers, the complexity will go up by 10 to 100 square, which is you know, kind of very high as compared to B log B. And so this is graceful degradation. And if something, if suppose you, you design for four, mil, four microsecond delay spread and the delay spread is, is five microsecond, this will not just die, it will gracefully degrade. Robustness against frequency selective burst errors. Now, what is a frequency selective burst errors? So what happens is when you get the errors, 
you get two kinds of errors one which affects all the whole spectrum right and some noise will just affect one frequency or maybe two frequencies or some frequencies those noises are called frequency selective right so if you have let's say one or two frequencies die out because of the noise that doesn't really kill your whole thing okay so this is robust so this actually still works if there is a frequency selective error allows adaptive modulation and coding of subcarriers and each carrier can be modulated differently so here some of them could be using could be using qualm 16 some could be using 64 qualm some could be using bpsk depending upon how much noise you have you can selectively modulate them robustness against narrow band interference so that is again saying frequency selective is that if the interference is affects only a part of the spectrum some carriers then this is robust this is actually a repeat of the previous one then we have allows pilot subcarriers for channel estimation so another thing we do is that not all the carriers are used for data some of them are just used for sensing so some of the carriers carry all the time known data so when they carry known data we can figure out what is happening at that frequency all right so for measurement so so we can estimate the channel so so that is the last point is that we can use some carriers for pilot actually what they do is they don't use some carriers for pilot all the time they use let's say 25 percent of the carriers for pilot for the first millisecond or first microsecond or something and the next microsecond they will use some other 25 percent of the subcarriers so they keep changing the pilot subcarriers all the time so that way they have the complete spectrum complete idea of what's happening everywhere on the spectrum right so now we introduce a new word here though so if i say the word pilot what does it mean what does pilot mean anybody Nobody knows what is pilot means. I, I, I just told you a second ago. No, I'm asking you. Yeah. No, okay. Shall so I start all over again? Okay. So remember, in, in while doing the wireless transmissions, we have to sense, we have to f estimate the channel. We have to find out what the wh where the noise is, how much is the noise, and all that. We have to keep making the channel model, right? how do we do that we use some carriers to do that basically we send some known data on those carriers so that when the receiver receives them they can say well the error is so much the noise is so much the noise is very little noise is good whatever it is right and the phase difference is so much so we can estimate the channel using those carriers those are called the pilot subcarriers Is it clear now or is it, should I say more? Is it clear what is a pilot subcarrier? Can you say it in your own words? Good, perfect. So we might use as many as 25% of our channels for pilot and the 75% for data. Right? And then what we might do is we might change those 25 percent, which 25 percent, which channel will we use for pilot as we go by time. So first we might use every fourth one, then we might use the second and fifth and, and so on and so forth, then we might use the other fourth one and so on and so forth. The, the, so the pilot subcarriers are not fixed for life, we just keep changing them. So is that point clear? Right? So that way we get the estimate of all the channels because on all the channels uh, sorry all the subcarriers we have sent some known data for some time obviously we have to keep estimating it because it keeps changing 
The channel keeps changing. So if you estimated something yesterday, it's no good today, right? In fact, if you estimate something an hour ago, it's no good in this hour. If you estimate something in the last minute, it's no good. In fact, it's only the channel remains the same because the car is moving, the car will remain in the same place for a few microseconds. Right, so channel estimation is good for a few microseconds. Right? And so we do this continuously. So every few microseconds we have to re-estimate this whole thing. All right. So design considerations. First of all, the large number of carriers and um, the, the more carriers you have, so why not we have 10,000 carriers? Why stop at 1,000? Because the more carriers you have, you have smaller data rate per carriers and the symbol duration becomes bigger and bigger, which is good actually, and less symbol interference. So the large number of carriers is good in that sense so far. Because if you have 10,000, each symbol is taking actually is actually the symbols are far apart basically that what mean is that symbols are far apart and therefore they cannot run into each other however that requires a lot of calculation not only calculation that calculation is the next point before that the problem is that um, the intercarrier interference can happen so what can happen is that you sent 100 megahertz but it can become 100.1 megahertz because of the Doppler effect, right? And, and, and 100.1 might be the next carrier. So then you cannot distinguish between the two carriers simply because things are moving. So when you want to design something for motion, then you have to worry about how much is the Doppler spread and you have to keep the, keep the carriers such that they don't run into each other. So the number of carriers is limited because of the Doppler and it's also limited because of the power of the DSP. I mean the more to manipulate a matrix of 100 by 1000 by 1000 is some work but to manipulate a matrix of 10,000 by 10,000 is 100 times more work. You need 100 times more powerful DSP. So you cannot do that. But uh, nowadays it is very computationally efficient way and therefore we are increasing. So here's the thing now, right now, let me give you exact numbers. Initially when we use A and G, the numbers of subcarriers were small from 50 to 256. I don't have the exact number, I'll have to look it up myself, but in the hundreds. And then five years later when, they, when we did F y max, in y max we use 1000, all right? Now, five years from now, when we do something else, actually YMAX next generation, we will do 2000. So as the computing power is growing, we can do more and more subcarriers. At least the third point, right? Now, we may still have to worry about the Doppler spread. And so we will have to worry about as to how to avoid that by basically if you want to cover a lot of motion, then you have to decrease the distance so that the Doppler spread is still taken care of. So there are lots of trade-offs here. But as the time goes by, we can do more and more carriers. The next word is S, sorry, OFDMA. So I have just added the letter A to the end of the OFDM. A stands for axis, multiple axis. So th previously it was multiple division and this is multiple axis. And, uh, so there is a very fine difference between the multiplexing and multiple axis. Basically, when, if I would have kept, if I would have given some subcarriers to user one, some subcarriers to user two, some subcarriers to user three, that would be called OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. In OFDM, basically all the frequencies are given, sorry, this is called frequency division multiplexing. On the other hand, in OFDM, if we give all the frequency to user one for some time, that is, and then second user, and then third user, that is called OFDM. So OFDM is where we divide into multiple frequencies which are orthogonal, but we give all the frequencies to one user. All right? But then people said, why do we give all the frequencies to one user? Why can't we just do so that we give to user number one certain frequencies, and then we can give the rest frequencies to user number two, 
and the third and fourth and so on and so forth and in fact we can give different times too we can say to user one please transmit on these frequencies for this much time and then user four will transmit there and so on when we do this kind of two dimensional scheduling that is called OFDMA in so frequency division multiplexing means we give we divide the spectrum into frequency that is FDM first line first figure that FDM is dividing the spectrum into frequency multiple frequencies OFDM means those frequencies are orthogonal all right those carriers are orthogonal and we give all the carriers to one user we just you know and if we start dividing them into frequency and time two dimensional then that is called OFDMA all right so what is the difference between OFDM and OFDMA this is OFDM this is OFDMA what is the difference in OFDM all the carriers are given to one user in OFDMA only some carriers are given to a user at a time so each user is given a time so for example this user is told the red user that he will start transmitting at time this much and continue up to this time and on this frequency to that frequency all right that is OFDMA then there is one more form of OFDMA called SOFDMA scalable OFDMA and basically the scalability means that we can use it for any once you make the design then you can use it for any frequency bandwidth see what happens is when you go to a country you get a spectrum you say well I want a spectrum they might give you 1.2 megahertz they might give you 2.4 megahertz depending upon how much is available they might give it to you and so the new standards like BIMAX are being designed so that you can use make use of what is given to you so we don't know how much you will be given so all the design is cannot be based upon how much spectrum you have the previous older standards they all assumed that everybody has 1.25 megahertz period but new standards cannot assume that and therefore they design in the scalable manner so that it, it doesn't matter how much they keep the spacing fixed they keep the spacing fixed and they change the number of carriers depending upon the width so for example in uh, Vimax right now the spacing is fixed as 10 kilohertz 10.94 kilohertz so whatever spectrum you get we divide that spectrum by 10.94 to, to determine how many carriers you should have so if you are getting given 1.25 we divide 1.25 by 10.94 and that will come out with some number and that is the number of carriers you are supposed to have if you get three times as much or uh, 3.5 you divide that by this so as long as you keep the frequency spacing constant and you vary the number of carriers proportional to the spectrum available that is called a scalable OFDMA that's the only thing we could change the spacing we could change the number of carriers and we could experiment but they said no 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 if you do that then the same circuitry will not work if you want to keep the same circuitry working for many of these things then let's keep one thing fixed and that is the spacing so if you keep the spacing fixed that gives you a scalable FDMA that brings to the end of this part and um, so these are the five key points first point is empirical channel models so they are called empirical because somebody measured them they are based upon the measurement and one of the most well known empirical channel model is what anybody remembers the name HATA so HATA channel model and then there is cast and so on and so forth and ITU then we talked about the diversity we talked about the receive diversity transmit diversity smart and then uh, this was the beam farming and then MIMO so in transmit diversity what do we do what do we do in transmit diversity you do multiple transmitters right and MIMO in MIMO what do we do we use multiple what multiple multiple means multiple uh, transmitter antenna as well as the multiple receive antenna so we combine both receive and transmit diversity then what is the space time block code a space time block code you use when you have what is the space when you have multiple antennas so that is your space and then you divide the time into multiple slots 
and then you send signals in some mathematically coded way such that they help you out to increase the, in the coding rate, the bit rate. That is space time block code. And then we talk about OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiple access, right? Where you do both frequency and time duplexing. Now the homework. The homework is in a scalable OFDMA system, the number of carriers for 10 megahertz is 1024. How many carriers will there be? So this is by kind of, you know, just based upon the last um, part, you should be able to figure out the spacing and the number of carriers. I think I need to add more homework to this because we should really have homework that covers the entire um, lecture so that we, you need to read the channel models as well. Anyway, here is the reading list. Again, the, this is the handout that we were talking about, the channel model tutorial. And the rest of the things are actually very easily available on Wikipedia. So I have given the references to Wikipedia. And please do read that and I will have to think about some homework so that um, to make sure that you have read these things before too late. All right.